John Burnside is a poet, novelist, and professor of English at the University of St. Andrews. He has won the Jeffrey Faber Prize, the Whitbed Poetry Prize, the Petraka? Petraka, yeah. The Petraka Prize, and most recently, the Forward and T.S. Eliot Prizes for his poetry. Welcome, John, again to the Bibliophile. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> So I want to get into some heavy stuff here. The role of the poet, what you do, how you do it, why you do it, while at the same time riffing off your book of, you want to call it criticism? Sure, yeah. The Music of Time, Poetry in the 20th Century. So it seems to me that that book is pushback against Auden's Poetry making nothing happen. Is that true? Yeah, kind of. Um, you know, I, I can take Auden's point. You know, um, uh, I think if you, if you approach poetry's role in society or po poetry's political impact in a, in a naive way or a simplistic way, Auden is perfectly correct in what he's saying. I mean, the, the thing is that we usually take that Auden line out of the overall context of the poem, I mean, say, yeah. oh, it makes nothing happen. But what he does go on to say is actually something really kind of, actually in many ways more primal and fundamental than, than mere politics. You know, poetry is a way of being. And my piece on that, that particular poem in the book, I wanted to relate it to what he calls poetry a mouth, you know. I wanted to relate to the most basic activities of human beings, speaking, but also eating, breathing. The poetry is actually a kind of primal thing. And of course it doesn't make things happen in the sense of, oh, I wrote a poem and it ended, ended the, you know, the war or something, or it changed the political climate. Poetry can, can contribute in small ways, just as any individual p person taking political action can contribute in small ways. But I, I also wanted to, that's one side of it, and I agree with Auden on that side of saying, of course, don't be naive, don't be silly, you can't make, you can't write a poem and change the world. But on the other hand, I wanted to say poetry, not just the writing of a poem on a page and publishing it, which is one part of poetry, but living poetry, living your life as, as a discipline in poetry does make a change in the world. And, and Auden's own life made a change in the world. The gravitas, the collected way of his own work and his person made a difference in the culture. And that's all we can ask for actually from a poet that they in some way move the dial of the culture ever so slightly in the right direction. Well, it's about paying attention too. Yeah. It seems to me that poetry is first of all about paying attention, which is a political act. Oh also getting attention too i mean you don't want to just be a tree out in the forest and no one <laughs> so maybe yeah. look at that like how is paying attention political and important well i think the making of a poem starts from listening um, i think people forget that sometimes the poem doesn't start from speaking it starts from the moment before that one one is listening and of course, yeah. at the end of a poem, one's listening again, sometimes to the poem itself, feeding back, as it were. Um, and, and, you know, you're hearing the sound of the poem and the music of the poem that you just made. And usually, you know, for me anyway, when I finish or finish a poem, you know, come close to finishing a poem, there is a sense of surprise. And, and, and did I make that? No, I came from somewhere. And I don't want to make <laughs> that I don't believe in that kind of you know, muse, inspiration, stuff in literal way. But it does seem to come from somewhere. And I think a, a, a poet is almost like kind of um, lightning rod for things that are happening around them. But they start, I think for me, it starts from listening. And listening is the, is the kind of most attuned form of attention. I've been lucky enough to walk in places where, you know, it's very quiet still. Most of the world is pretty noisy, but there are some places where it's still almost silent. And um, there's this astonishing sensation I've had anyway, in certain places in, in, in high tundra, in Northern Norway, in, in desert, in the Southwest of the United States, and, uh, and the Pampas, on the Pampas in Argentina, 
and places where the, you know it's high, not highly populated, where it's wide open spaces, and there's there's a sound. There's, it's more than a sound. There's a, something coming out of the earth, as it were, that one can trace, one can detect. And I remember, I remember, I I was in the north of Norway, and I asked my friend who's a Sami, and then I said, um, you know, when I was up at Alta, I was on the ridge towards Alta, and I could I could hear the sound. And I tried to figure out what it was, and it wasn't the wind, and it wasn't this. He said, "Yeah, that's the sound of the earth. Uh, if, you, if it's quiet enough, you can hear it." And the Sami people have this this uh, story about how the world was made, and the world was made by taking a two year old reindeer, and the center of the world was made from the heart, and the rest of the world was made from the body of the reindeer. The trees were its hair, the rivers were its blood, etc. And the Sami people say that if you put your ear to the ground, and listen. You can still hear the heartbeat of the reindeer coming out of the ground, as it were. Mm. If they come to a point where you can't hear that sound anymore, it means the human race is doomed. We're finished. And I said to my friend one time, um, another friend, do you do that? Do you ever put your ear to the ground and listen? He said, you know, I don't anymore because I'm afraid because um, I, I'm, these days I'm so scared that maybe yeah. I won't hear anything. But yeah. I still, I still hope that one can hear that, and you know, coming. I think it comes from the earth for me. Some people might say it comes from the sky. I don't know, but but that attentiveness, and then there's the, the there's a political quality, a valency to paying attention to quotidian details, the details of the everyday of everyday life. People are constantly trying to sell us garbage, which is you know kind of exotic and glamorous and superficial and really, really uh, superfluous to our requirements. Mm-hmm. And they're constantly trying to distract us from appreciating things like, you know, the ordinary stuff around us. You know, people say the best things in life and life are free, but nobody would seem to live by that. And of course, there's a lot of effort going into making sure that nothing is left that is free. But um, I like the old Japanese idea of wabi-sabi, you know, the idea of um, simple, Everyday things contain this kind of more than beauty. It's, it's beauty, but it's more than that. It's something else. But you only get it by paying attention to it. You, you only get it by, you know, investing your attention. Well, the other thing too is uh, paying attention to words, to how they're used by advertisers and politicians, enables you to detect bullshit better. Yeah, and sadly. Uh, not just advertisers and politicians, but also uh, some poets <laughs> and other writers. <laughs> well, I mean, you know what? I, you know what I was about to say, and I've, yeah. this keeps coming up, is that I want to listen to a really, really intelligent person. I don't want to listen to, uh, I, I mean, I'll give time to other people, sure. <laughs> I want to spend most of my time paying really close attention to what really smart people say yeah. and and how they say it yeah is that elitist or what what's the is there a problem with that well this is the great thing of our time is that in our culture there's a accusation of elitism uh, for me i i and, and i don't make a big badge out of this or anything but i am dirt poor working class where i came from you know yeah, yeah. Uh, i was my father was a was a, a seasonal casual uh, construction worker um an occasional agricultural worker we had nothing, no books in the house, none of that. So I'm not kind of guarding some kind of citadel of um, you know middle class values or anything. When I say that the things that we normally think of as people classes, culture, or even high culture, are the things that rescued me from a from a life that was pretty difficult at times. I didn't have any sense that uh, reading, say, Marianne Moore or um, the novels of Orwell or um, the 19th century classics had any kind of social import. They were, they, were, they were personal experiences of finding something in the world that I recognized and clung on to because they made, made sense in a way that my life, my daily life didn't. And I, mm. I, I can't stand this idea that people say, oh, well, I, I think craft is important in poetry. I think it's important to say something interesting and not just simply talk to people who are like me. A lot of the stuff I read at the moment it's people talking to other people who are like them, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and we all share this. And 
you will say things like, oh, I don't like this novel because I didn't like Ken and Vidya in the book. And you think, do you like the characters in Dostoevsky? <laughs> you know, yeah. or, or, or Samuel Beckett? It's not about finding soulmates in the pages so you can talk about the, you know, the latest fashions with. It's about understanding the widest range of the human, you know, I use a cliche, but the human condition, the human soul, whatever. Okay, and so you say it's important. about that, but so what, what's so important about that? So that we can, we can understand each other and maybe get along a bit better and understand ourselves and get along with ourselves a little bit better too. I'm not saying that art has that function as such. I think you can make art as perfectly, uh, it, it has a, a meaning in some other way, but certainly if you read the 19th century classic novels, the ones that are always considered classics, everyone says they read them, nobody does anymore. But if you read them, which I did when I was far too young to read them actually, you learn something about um, some of the questions that dog being human, you know, you learn something about that. I mean, you could also from that develop sort of anxieties as well. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah. People are so keen now to, uh, to avoid anxiety, to avoid confrontations with difficult subjects. They want entertainment and entertainment is great. And I don't want to say let's not have entertainment, but I look at the TV shows that are on, the, the advertising, the art shows that are going to come up soon. And they're about things like, um, you know, West End musicals participation like things like amateur painter of the year or something that's it when i was a kid we used to have a show called omnibus for example which would have interviews with you know i remember seeing don delillo being interviewed there an incredibly intensive hour of just hearing this guy talk about making his work and what it meant I, i'm not saying i don't i'm not saying let's exile West End musicals or, or, or amateur art from TV. I'm just saying, please continue to have something for someone like me who happens to like these things. And I'm the least elitist person I can think of coming from my background. And yeah. I still have a huge chip on my shoulder from a class point of view. Yeah. And I certainly don't equate, quote, high art with a social standing or, you know, the kind of T.S. Eliot type uh, idea of, um, you know, that there should be a certain class of society who guard the the values of culture. I don't really don't kind of stand that kind of idea. Well, you talk about all this stuff on TV. A big part of it, I guess, is poetry is competing with that. Get back to my first question about attention. Mm. So how you do you, as a poet, get uh, attention? Yeah, that's a difficult question. <laughs> um, because there's apathy out there. People think, as you you met, you know, you talk about in your book, it's bad PR that, that a lot of poetry gets. That it's difficult. It requires effort, and people don't want to do that. They just want to be entertained. Yeah, but I, I try, I try to figure out why. I mean, if someone says to me, "I'm a big fan of Sudoku and puzzles like that," you know, can can Sudoku, those kind of things. If someone comes and gives me a Sudoku um, book and says, "Here, you'll enjoy this. It's really easy." Yeah. I say, no, thank you. I want the one that says super fiendish. <laughs> you know, it would be, be kind of fun. And right. I don't understand why people think that because poetry is sometimes difficult, um, that one wouldn't enjoy that. I enjoy things that are difficult. I mean, I do like to watch, uh, say, a movie with my kids, watch something like, uh, you know, a Marvel comics type movie or a musical of this, uh, you know, Hollywood style. But it doesn't compare for me personally with the experience I have of watching, say, Throne of Blood. Okay, or, so, John, how do you get attention? I don't. In what, in what you've written? Yeah. The actual writing on the page? Yeah. You know, given where we're at right now. Yeah. Well, I, I actually don't get attention. We got a whole know. bunch of prizes. That's big attention. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while since I had a prize, but yeah. Um, <laughs> no, um, I know that a lot of poets do things like social media and they have a blog and a website and all those things. I don't have mm -hmm. any of those things. You know, I have a family and I have a job and I don't have time. <laughs> to yes, help. okay. When, as a poet, you will first of yeah. all you write something. Yeah. You someone to pay attention to it you want to hold their attention because yeah. you've got i assume you've got something valuable to say to them so how do you do that on the page itself then 
there's only two things that really matter on the page. One is the craft, the craft of making, which, which brings the muse. Somehow you have to take a silent page and have someone looking at that silent page hear music. And so that's first in the use of the language, the language itself is musical. And secondly, is the construction, if you like, the craft of, of, of putting those musical phrases together. So in a sense, you'd say that was like composition. Um, so that's one thing. And yeah. uh, on the other hand, there's what people might call the content of the poem. And that's a bit more tri tricky. Um, if you write a poem about something that matters to you, but doesn't matter to anybody else, they may enjoy the musicality of the poem, but if they don't engage with the subject matter, they'll probably turn away from it. And that's my main worry is that a lot of people aren't interested in the subject matter that certainly interests me. And when I read someone like um, Wallace Stevens, say, let's take Wallace Stevens, a quite a philosophical poet, I have found it intensely rewarding to read Wallace Stevens and puzzle about what he's saying and figure out the philosophical ideas. And I find that more and more um, people say to me things like, oh, why did you talk about this subject? Or um, another thing might be, why did you uh, quote you know, from this poet? Why did you make an allusion to this poet? Nobody reads that poet anymore. Well, I say, well, they ought to. You yeah, know? yeah. If I make an allusion to Montale, and, I, and these days I do it in English. I mean, I used to be very, I, I really believe that one should hear something in the original language. And I used to often quote the original language. I mean, even had, for example, Spanish lines in my, my poems, but allusions. But even now making an allusion, people won't get that allusion, but hopefully they'll still read the poem and enjoy the poem. But I really hope that people will say, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what this guy is like. Let's go and read him, you know. Right. So it's a prompt to, to learn more, I guess. Yeah. And, and, and also to share because, you know, I remember when I first read Leopardi's poetry, for example, I just felt, I felt I'd been hit by, by a bus, you know. It's extraordinarily psychologically and musically and philosophically an extraordinary experience. Right. Just, oh, I, don't, I don't want to read a poet from you know, a dead Italian poet, you know, who yeah. was erotic. But you're bringing yourself, you're bringing your own curious mind to it as well, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's basically the same as an, an enthusiast for anything. I have an enthusiasm for, say, for example, the poetry of, of um, uh, Montale who I, I adore, Montali, and, um, you know, and he's well translated into English. Uh, yeah, Jonathan Galassi is... Uh, brilliant, kind of, brilliant, Galassi yeah. translations, yeah. And, the, and they're not only beautifully done in terms of the verse itself, but also the, the accuracy of the conveying the, 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 the original. So anyone can read it without knowing Italian. And I want to say, look at this amazing poet. I wouldn't be writing at all today, maybe, I yeah. be writing about it, unless I'd found this guy and felt, oh, it's, 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 this is something I want to pursue, you know? You feel that it's given you such pleasure and stimulation, you want, to, you want others to experience the same thing, is that it? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Not okay. only pleasure, but actually the big subject, meaning in some yes. way, you know, yeah. meaning has yeah. come out of this, and that's the big mystery. Why does anything have meaning? You say the, the truth is that contemporary poetry will often seem difficult in its own era, only to become common currency in the next. Yeah. And you say it is worth engaging with it, nevertheless, for its music and for the associations it provokes, sometimes quite unexpectedly in the imagination. So again, why is that important? Well, the associations? Yeah, uh, why, why is it worth engaging for uh, the associations that happen unexpectedly in your imagination? Yeah, okay. See, I, I, I make a distinction, probably entirely personal, I don't even know, but I make a distinction between clever and intelligent, you know? There are right. a lot of people, a lot of people involved in the arts who are very clever, and they make very clever things, and they're quite ad admirable and, and enjoyable to behold. But for me, um, I look at the kind of... The, the deeper meaning of the word intelligence, which if you trace it back, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm twisting the etymology a little bit, but intelligence means making connections, joining things together, yeah. bringing yeah. things together. And I think that there are two, at two levels, our, our world around us, our sense of the world around us is fragmented. 
is, is damaged, is broken. One is because everybody, all the scientists tell me that if, when you're a baby, the world is a continuum around you. So I still believe the world is a continuum around me, but I fragment it by calling it stuff and compartmentalizing and classifying and you yeah. know, applying taxonomic rules, etc. And that's useful, just as it's useful to have a calendar or a clock, but none of it makes any sense in the real world. The world out there isn't about, as the Jefferson Airplane once said, the human name doesn't mean shit to a tree. I like that line. Yeah. Yeah. We, use, we use these conventions to, to handle the world. But it's nice to have that reminder that actually it's continuous. It's all one. Well, path. I think that, you know, in a funny way, I've been thinking about this lately. I've, I've had some amazing coincidences happen to me in my life. Mm -hmm. Beyond the rational explanation, you can choose to take it whichever way you want. But partly, I think it's like an enlightened moment where you see that, well, you know what? So many things are connected. Yeah. Yeah. The whole thing is that we don't, we, we get blinded. I remember reading somewhere, I think it was a psychiatrist who wrote this, maybe R.D. Lang. I, I can't remember. I remember reading, if we, if we did experience the world like that all the time, how difficult it would be get, to get through the day. Yeah, I, I'm, right. you know, and I had, yeah. I had my teenage and early 20s uh, LSD experiences, which I've written about, and I, I value highly. I don't need LSD anymore. I wouldn't be taking it anymore. But at that time, it made a huge difference to my life. Because LSD instantly plunges you into the that sense of continuum. And a yeah. lot of research has been done recently about mushrooms, LSD, other, other psychotropic uh, substances that yeah. actually help to cure things like depression. Alcohol. Exactly. Yeah, they're finally, it's finally being sort of legalized. Yeah, at least for medical purposes, hopefully. Yeah. Well, the other thing that we're, you know, we, we're talking about logic, we're talking about words and understanding, but one of the key things that you try to get at in your book and do is la raison poetica. It, it will call for that to be placed on its proper footing, mm -hmm. the method for investigating the given world as a, that beyond reason to be to be put on an equal footing with logical methods so that human beings come to see that in the overall scheme of things, the music of what happens is all one fabric, which is kind of what we just talked about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what we think of as noise is part of that fabric's warp and weft. The obligation we have as observers and venerators is to become more attentive to that uh, fabric and so learn more how to stay attuned to the music we have been given rather than trying to create a perfect harmony that can never exist. So by being more attuned to it, what? We're not going to disagree and argue so much and we, we're not going to have war? <laughs> I don't think it's that simple, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I think there have been cultures who avoided I think there's two different kinds of conflict. One is the kind of conflict that happens naturally. That is, you know, you got something I want, I'm going to try and take it off you. But right. if it costs me so much to take it from you that it isn't worth that battle, I don't do it. But modern warfare is, I don't give a shit, I'm going to do it anyway, because um, you know, I've got to prove that I'm the, I'm the boss, I'm the number one superpower, etc. Um, animals do this all the time. An animal will see another animal with something and try and get it off them. But if the risk of getting hurt and injured, because if you're injured in the wild, you're going to die probably, it's too great. They won't do it. So, you know, I mean, the old Celtic, I have high stock on, on, on the kind of Celtic traditions. And the old Celts used to do, go on um, raiding parties to steal cattle from each other and that kind of stuff. It's almost like a right. game at times. But you know that kind of that kind of conflict, I think, is going to happen. That's a kind of natural one. But I mean, industrial scale conflict, I think, could be avoided more if um, we were to use all of our faculties. I mean, the main point about La Razón Poetica, which is not my idea at all, but for coming from Maria Zambrano, the great philosopher poet from the Civil War period and beyond. The great thing is not to say, let's jettison deductive reasoning. That's very useful. Nobody's saying yes. throw away logic. Alongside logic, alongside that kind of way of uh, experiencing the world, let's also value intuition, imagine, imagination, feeling, 
feeling. And, you know, yeah. I, and I always remember what Rachel Carson said, you know, if you know it's not enough, you have to know and to feel, you know? But Rachel Carson said, you know, no, knowing is not enough to know and to feel. And I think if you put that together, you get wisdom, knowledge without the kind of feeling, knowledge without that, that overall uh, engagement of all of the faculties, not just to you know, your deductive logic, as it were, it comes to wisdom. And I think if we all become wiser, we'll probably be less destructive. I think it mainly in an environmental context, though. I mean, so many things have happened that destructive to the environment where it made absolutely no sense to one's intuition or one's imagination to do something. But logically, it said, oh, I can make money doing this or I can solve this problem doing yeah. this, uh, you yeah. know. Well, it's, uh, that sort of blotted out everything else, didn't it? Exactly, yeah. I mean, it's like, uh, I remember reading about the Odin brothers, for example, two guys who um, had this idea that we needed to get rid of toxic waste. And marshlands you know, work in a very much similar way to things that, that we, mechanical things that we use to absorb waste. So why not just tip it into marshlands and manage the marshlands as toxic, you know? And I, I kind of growing up, I remember when I first got involved with environmentalist, um, environmentalism, I remember the big uh, debate about dams, about hydroelectric dams. And in, if you're in Oslo or Washington or Beijing or wherever it might be, it made absolute sense to dam this river and get cheap electricity. But if you're on the river and you lived there and you, were, you, you lived off the river, not only in terms of your day-to-day -day feeding yourself, et cetera, but also your spiritual life, your entire spiritual life is based on the river. For example, in North Nor Norway, there are two great rivers, the, Alta, the Tana River and the Alta River. Um, they, they put a huge dam across the Alta River in, in North Norway. The, 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 the Sami people revolted against this and they were saying, why? You know, it, it's giving people cheap electricity and they're saying, you're destroying the river, you're killing the river. And the same thing happened in the northwest of the United States. And Arne Ness went and, and, and tried to raise awareness of all this. But if you're sitting in a, in a, in a decision-making forum in Washington or Oslo, you're simply using your deductive processes and saying, it makes absolute sense to me to do this. Well, yeah. that's right, because my mandate is to make money. My make money or to solve certain problems? Yeah, but my mandate is, is very narrow. It's to yeah. get people employed or, yeah, make profit. Or it, It's interesting you're talking about dams because you've always been interested in water management. And I thought you were, yeah. use, I thought you were using that metaphor uh, as a metaphor for what you do with poetry. True, yeah, yeah. But throughout the book, in fact, I mean, that actually came about almost by kind of serendipity rather than planning. I was in Singapore at the start of the rainy season. You know, all, they have these elaborate um, water courses that, that drain the water off and the rain comes down really hard. And right. I've been in different places before I did that. But I just so happened to be working on some of the research while I was very um, kindly being put up in Singapore as a you know resident scholar there. And I just thought, yeah, um, what I need to do is, is, is to draw on all these different ways in which humankind has not only managed water flow, but done it in such beautiful ways and done it with such art and grace. So I, I remember the, 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 the Alps, uh, the, the beasts, uh, they call them the beasts in the north, not in, uh, the higher Alps, where they manage the flood water that comes when the um, snow melts. And in fact, that system is beginning to crack now because of the global uh, climate change global warming, I want to say, really. Uh, climate change is a terrible term, you know, but anyway, and other places where I've seen this, you know, and I thought, yeah, this is, another, this is a parallel for me for the way in which we take some kind of elemental natural energy, which is what, where poetry comes from, and find a way of, con you know, conducting it, as it were, directing yeah. it in, into a certain kind of flow. But we have to consume it to use an awful term, using using everything that we've just talked about, it's. Uh, yeah. I suppose it's is is that what you're you're the, you're trying to convey is that we're not using enough of our brains. Yeah, well, I guess the trouble is, of course, if you use the word brain, people start yeah. thinking about deductive logic, deductive reasoning, and logic and things. So we're not using enough of our fac. I I like the word faculties, um, right. and of course. 
our faculties reside in our entire bodies, uh, in, in, in the meat of, to use terms like the meat of your spine or the marrow of your bones, as well as your brain, of course. And there's, there's nothing anti-intellectual about any of this, but... It's just to added to it. Yeah, yeah. It's like wake the whole body up, not just the brain, you know. <laughs> when you said that, it was funny because I automatically thought of killing all the lawyers. <laughs> I do that every day. <laughs> <laughs> because it seems to me that, again, they know the law. They made the law in many cases. Uh -huh. And uh, they're restricting, well... Anyway, I, I won't get onto a rant about that. I just say that uh, how do you enrich in your life then? By paying attention? Is that the main thing? And yeah. using all your faculties? Yeah. And why is that important? Why is it important? Well, one, one of the things that I feel is um, I feel a threat from, I don't know how much other people feel it, but I feel it quite intensely. I worked in the computer industry for 10 years. I worked in commercial computing, you know, business computing. I, that's because I love computers and I played around with computers before that. And I, I actually had a situation where I had no money and my partner at the time said, well, why don't you get a job in computing? I said, well, you just walk into a job. <laughs> right. Yeah, you can. You, actually, in those days, you could. You take an aptitude <laughs> test and you, you get a job, you know, you start pretty well, but you quickly, you know, climb the tree as it were. And I, I worked in computing and very happily for most of the 10 years I was working in that business. But for me, computers were never anything but tools for, for connectivity, for uh, the useful tools for other things as well. I never had any mystique about um, systems, computer systems, other than the, the, the beauty of systems themselves. If you use the word systems these days, almost everyone will think you mean computer systems of some kind. But yeah. I was a systems thinker, and that's what I liked. And so I, I took naturally to computing. And I worked, and in fact, my main uh, job for most of the time I was working was um, I worked in knowledge-based systems. I was a systems engineer, is what they call it. But um, I like again, it goes back to what we're talking about about relationships and, and continuum and that kind of thing. S understanding systems, uh, I was interested in systems from looking at ecosystems. But that was the mistake: systems, not the machinery or the technology or the apparatus or you know those things. The, the, and those are see, those are not human, are they? Because no. you go to a place, they'll say, "Well, the system doesn't do that." Sorry, we can't. Yeah, exactly. The system says we can't do that. Our, our more and more, of course, is what is happening is that people don't actually know what the system does anymore, because we have we have created batteries of algorithms which we don't understand their compound effect. There are people breaking away from companies like Facebook and others who are saying now publicly that there, there are systems that have been created that we can't control them, we can't predict them, we don't know what they're doing. And that's why people are getting, you know, if you, you show a mild interest in, say, a slightly right-wing topic next, and you get bombarded with recommendations, for the Proud Boys or something like that, you know, you know. I mean, it's, that's a bit simplistic, but you know what I'm saying. Yes. You, you yeah. Kind of put your toe in the water over here, and they pour a bucket of the stuff over you, because this, really? the algorithms are set up to do that because they want to maximize your your, your use of the system. So imagine yeah. any other tool that actually, instead of you controlling it, it controlled you. You know. Yeah. Well, so how does I mean I've heard that code is poetry, but how does this relate to poetry then? I've never seen it that way, I'm afraid. <laughs> I've heard that. I'm just saying. Yeah, I've heard it too, but I have never seen I've never seen it in that way. How are we relating these algorithms to poetry then? Is it what I'm saying is what I'm saying is really is the talking about attention is yeah, uh, our attention is I, I, I use the idea of enclosure. I'm actually working on something now. I'm trying to write something now about the whole idea of enclosure. I touched on it briefly in the book. I touched on it in other places too. Um, the, the, the manuscript I sent you, the Orox Knox book, I talk a little bit about it. But back in the say, 18th century, the, it, it preceded that, but also especially in the 18th century and 19th century, we think of the enclosures of land that took John Clare's home away from him and you know that kind of thing. And we think of the clearances in Scotland where they pushed some people off the land. So they enclosed the land. They, the, the people who were very powerful enclosed the land for their use, mostly for sheep in Britain anyway. 
that's one thing, enclosure of land. And then you get other enclosures, like enclosure of going back to the days when people used to have the midwife and the local um, healer, the homeopathic healer, people like that. Local people who were part of the community who worked in kind of medicine, if you like. And then there was the enclosure of that so that only people who are authorized, who are qualified, yes. And mostly male and mostly middle class, mostly from outside that community, could determine health policies, etc. So these kinds of acts of enclosure have become in, in the in our own time have become the enclosure of the imagination, enclosure of our attention. And so we want to we want to pay attention to the world around us, but more and more the attention we're paying is to things that are actually virtual and they've been created in, in a you know in, in a coding shop somewhere, or worse, in in a you know, in a Russian bot factory. Yes. You know? So going back to poetry can redirect uh, our attention back to the things or towards the things that actually enrich our lives and they're actually naturally occurring, a given. Like what? Well, the natural world, so-called, you know, the world that's out there, uh, other, other human beings and not avatars of other human beings. Uh, the fact that um, everything is rooted in soil. Uh, yeah. I feel as though we're fast approaching a kind of hydroponic reality where we deny the fact that soil exists, you know, yes. uh, and also that we that we also are, are are creaturely. We are we are creatures of flesh and blood and bodily fluids and all those things. These are all things that we should be celebrating, not not uh, pretending don't exist. And most importantly, perhaps of all, is and, and this is more keen for me now, but it's always been something at the back of my mind is, why is it we live in a society that's so keen to deny death, that we die, you know, that, and yeah. that is part of a cycle of natural, a natural cycle, you know, Whitman writes about it beautifully. Um, well, you talk about uh, how poetry helps us to mourn, uh, putting words to sorrow. Yes, that's also a very important thing to first you have to acknowledge that you're mourning, you have to acknowledge that you feel grief, that you have uh, something that you're grieving. Grief, grief on its own is not enough, you have to find yeah. some kind of ritual or some kind of um, procedure to, to use mourning to give shape to your grief and to, to use your grief to carry forward. And uh, poetry can, of course, an elegy, for example, is, is a great example of this. Also, we think back to what Auden was saying, poetry making nothing happen. That's, that's, a, po that's a quote from a poem, which is an elegy for, for, for Yeats. Yeah. Well, it also helps us, hopefully, to understand, you know, that's, again, the, the, the baseline is there is, there's no meaning. But hopefully it'll help us understand causes, maybe, of, of why we're why we're mourning or why they're facing that kind of nothingness, that kind of, yeah. that, that confusion, you know? Yeah, and, and there is no intrinsic meaning in anything. No. But no. we invest meaning all the time. And we can, we can in, in fact, if we're intelligent enough about it emotionally and, and, and you know, logically in all the other ways, we can choose where we invest meaning. Yeah. Well, I... What we need then is to know the truth before we make that kind of judgment. Mm -hmm. And then you make that point really in an interesting way. You look at uh, JFK's assassination. There's a poem that, well, I think what happened is that some of that Zabruder video was cut out, right? You yeah. mentioned that. Yeah. Again, this kind of managing of history poetry allows you to get to the real small grain truth yeah i mean the zapruder history of course is that zapruder took the the film and then gave it raw to actually to first to one of the fbi guys or was maybe a security um you know those one of those guys anyway and eventually it was given back to him and he gave it to um time life in those days it was the executives there who decided that they weren't going to show, it was bad for morale to show the headshot, as they called it, the, the actual point at which Kennedy's head kind of burst open and there was yes. all that red blood, etc. It's amazing them people who, who remember the, that footage as being in black and white <laughs> because the, it's so drained of color, as it were. But I don't know if that's, in a moral sense, a correct decision or not. 
but I don't see how anyone can take it upon themselves to decide what the public should or should not see in a situation. But um, that's one thing. And that was a decision I think was made in good faith by many people to say, yeah, yeah, it's too, it's too awful. It's too awful. And it's too soon to process. Right. But the, the next thing that happened was a lot of very bad poetry was written and a lot of very bad art was made to, to kind of to create a kind of sanitized image of this. Uh, you know, this, it was a very simple kind of martyr narrative, really. And yeah. um, Zukovsky, for, I'll talk about Zukovsky briefly, but Zukovsky quoted what Fidel Castro had said about Kennedy. And, and he, he said, you know, um, we, don't, we don't celebrate the death of anybody. We don't, this, is, this man is our enemy, but we don't celebrate his death. We don't celebrate this event, but we still recognize that this man is our enemy. And that's important that, you know, instead of making him into a saint, we recognize who JFK actually was historically. Another good example, I talk about this briefly, is Wallace Stevens is one of my favorite poets in many ways, but what one does see in Wallace Stevens a certain quality which is, is, uh, makes up one ask questions of his work. And there's, there's a great uh, poem which um, uh, Terence Hayes wrote about Wallace Stevens. Um, yeah. You know, his famous... Sonnets? No, it's before the sonnets. But there's kind of openly racist uh, element of Stevens, which is casually racist, because he, he is a person of his time, and a person of his class and situation would be casually racist, the way T.S. Eliot was casually, uh, or Ezra Pound was slightly less casually, anti-Semitic. And, yeah. and, and Terence Hayes picks up on the, he picks up on the snowman poem and uses that as a starting point. He talks about love without forgiveness. That's a really interesting concept. You can respect someone, you can love somebody, but you don't, doesn't mean you have to erase all of their errors or sins. You still should recognize those things. And I think um, even, even Auden, um, I think wrote something, but uh, which was set to music by Stravinsky. These very simple kind of, Payings to the dead. Uh, if they're allergies, that's one thing. But if they're public events, that's something else. And if it's too soon to have the headshot, it's also too soon to have this kind of simplistic, you know. I think it was very interesting when after 9-11 happened, there was a rush of writers to put books out or essays or articles about 9-11. And I remember Delilo saying, you know, he wasn't, they were asking him, they were saying, when are you going to do your thing? And he didn't for something like several years anyway. The thing is, is I, I remember I met Tim O'Brien once, um, a very great writer who, you know, writing about Vietnam and stuff. And he was a he was a soldier there, but he didn't come straight back from there and start writing novels and, 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 and memoirs about in Vietnam. It was years later when he started writing them because you need to process that. You need to, you know, that kind of huge thing, you need to process it, mm -hmm. you know. So again, it's, it's, I think poetry and, well, hopefully all the literary arts, but poetry maybe in particular, insists on recognizing the complexity of things, not simplifying it. You know, I read a poem once, so-called poem. Um, I can't remember who wrote it. It was one of the kind of new poets who you stick on the fridge kind of thing. And it said something like, uh, I am brown and so is the earth and flowers. I can't remember exactly, but I am brown, and, but so is the earth and flowers come out of the earth and that's good. I mean, well, if that's your answer to racism, you've got a long way to go really, haven't you? But, you know, this kind of simplification of things down to making the right noises and, make, and, and, and holding up the right signs and... It clouds the truth, doesn't it? it, it well, yeah. Whatever the hell that is, but it, it yeah, clouds yeah. what really happened. It, it actually it, it blocks off the path to looking for the truth. Yes, you just yes. simply settle for this truism, how a half truth. You know, yeah, it's not enough. Yeah, it's interesting. We we were talking about well, racial injustice mm -hmm. and how that's such a powerful motivation for for poetry. And I don't even want to quote the N word in the poem that you write in your book. What do you think about that? So what's that doing to me? I, I actually think, I mean, this is an interesting question. Um, if you're reading Huckleberry Finn, say, or... Um, this is the Mahuda Budi yeah. poem you're, you're quoting? Yeah, but he, he was a black man, so he could, he could use that word. Exactly, so it's the, does that mean that you can only use certain words if you're you know, if you're that from that 
I think, no, I think in this case, I, for me anyway, not using the word. It's like cutting out a piece of the video, isn't it? Or is not it? For, not for me. I, I think it's, it's a respect. It's a mark of saying respectfully that right. word now, uh, because of the way it's been used and abused against people, Causes that pain. only yeah. Well, not only that, but it should only belong to black people. People, black yes, people, use I that see. word. Right, right. Um, that, and it's up to them the way that they, they, they want to use it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I see. I guess I mean that seems fair to me. And and yeah. the that I also think that a white person using the word would have to be think very very carefully at a very deep level about what using that word means to them. Yeah, but what I'm saying is I'm even concerned about reading out his poetry with that word. Yeah, I found that interesting being a teacher because obviously one has to be very sensitive in, in, in a classroom situation. And I work a lot with contemporary or recent poetry. I usually say to the students, look, if I, if I ask you to read the poem um, and you find a word that, you know, it makes you uncomfortable, just don't say it, just, just skip it. Right. We can see it on the page or whatever. Right. Um, I, will, I will actually, if I'm reading a text, I will read the word. As, and from a text, because I'm quoting from a historical exactly. writer. But again, that's that's a reading of the word. That's not me using it. Yeah. Yes, I see. And, and in fact, in what you do in the book is you do point to a lot of great poems. I like I like how you lay it out there that you think these are really great. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And just the mere fact that we're paying attention to them means they're important. I, I meet so many people who consider themselves interested in our culture, our literary culture, who don't read stuff that I think is essential to read. Right. You know? Right. Yes. Do you do really delineate them, them in, the, in this book, uh, in this book, The Music of Time, which is great, I think. So what else have we got on how how you <laughs> how you as a poet work i mean you talked about craft and mm -hmm. is there anything else about you know how you write poetry how do you do it <laughs> well i'm probably a little eccentric i'm not sure but <laughs> actually for contemporary poets i probably am but not historically <laughs> i i don't write poetry uh, i i compose it in my head uh, okay. Andrew Stam said he, he, he composed on the lips. And I think if I was compared to many contemporary poets who sit down and work on the page and revise and revise on the page, I would seem eccentric. But, I mean, Dante composed by walking. Um, words was composed by walking. Walking and saying it? Probably. Yeah. I certainly do, you know. But the thing is, someone say that, okay, you just make up a poem in your head and you write it down, that's it. thing right. is... The crafting process happens in my head, body, whatever you want to say. Um, While I, it isn't just I go for a walk, come back with a poem, write it down. That's not how it works. No. A poem might take um, two weeks to take form in my head before I write it down. Until relatively recently, I, I could do that without worrying about the memory aspect of it. These days, <laughs> not so much. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> and historically, it's, it's probably nowhere near as anomalous as it might sound, but... Usually the time I get to writing something on the page, most of it is already there. There might, there'll be some revision. Well, what and, is it that gets you thinking? Is it like, or motivated to do something? Is it, in, is it this sense of injustice? I suppose it is, but I don't come consciously start writing a poem ever. I don't think, oh, I'm going to write a poem today about this. I think the best analogy perhaps is John Adams said about his composing. When he composes, it's like they're creating a compost heap. What he does is um, he goes out into he has a little cabin out in the woods and he goes out in the woods and spends like months out there, you know, and just sits around doing nothing, absolutely nothing. That's he's ruminating. Or he's composting. Even. I remember the, the phrase he used, I come back and I work like a banker and I thought, that's probably not the best comparison, but he sits down <laughs> nine till five and just composes because the composting's happened in, in his body right. and then you start putting it down. I think that's probably the same with me. I, I go about my business and things are getting my head and I'm not even necessarily conscious of the fact that they're starting to take form as some kind of rhythms. And I'm, I'm yeah. even, not even necessarily words to begin with, that some yeah. kind of rhythm starts going on. You know what? That's what your book really reminds me of. Uh -huh. It reminds me of you doing that composting and witnessing all of that ruminating that's going on. And it's, that's, that's the prose 
Yes. It's prose about poetry, I suppose, but um, my, certainly my process for writing prose when I write novels and stories is a different process in many ways because at this first stage always happens in the same way. That it's like, you know, that kind of happening in the head or in the body, whatever. But when I start writing it down, it's going to be subjected to huge revision in prose. Well, rational and, and rules and yeah, yeah. Yeah, and just on the page activity. Actual on the page activity with poetry is, is relatively minimal, actually. You the, saved the that environment way. that way, John. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> no waste bins full of paper. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I do always use recycled paper. So that's <laughs> okay, so what, just if you could just tell me what some of the great poems then, if, if you don't mind. The ones that you think everyone should read. Throughout the ages or recently? Well, um, just in the book, the ones that you highlight in the oh, book. Oh, the ones in the book, yeah, right. Certainly everyone should read um, Morris Stevens' The Snowman. That's yeah. an amazing poem because it's asked so many questions. Comparable with that, and I put it right next to it, is um, For Ser de Martina of, of, of Montale, because that's that creates the same existential kind of moment that The Snowman does in a different way, a very different way. I think yeah. people should read um, Leopardi. Um, I, I talk about one poem, L'Infinito, but um, as a poet, generally, people should read it. Montale, everything by Montale, I think, is, is important to read. Marianne Moore, contemporary poets, Joy Harjo um, and uh, Terence Hayes, um, yeah, Charles yeah. Wright. I didn't say much about Charles Wright in the book, I want to say more. And of course, my favorite um, until recently um, living poet was uh, Lucy Brock Broido, who's uh, just an incredible word. Smith, is that the right word? Word Smith, maybe that's not the right word, but but mm -hmm. usually this is the language in ways that just refresh the language for me in, in amazing, surprising ways. Um, mm -hmm. And um, Auden, especially that particular poem, the, that elegy for Yeats is just an incredible poem. Um, and I also wanted to mention poets that were less well known towards the end, especially. I could have chosen a huge number of different poets. I wanted to speak about a little bit about poem, poets from you know, outside the usual. I mean, you think about English language poetry, you try to think about, you know, UK and the United States and Canada, I guess, maybe, mostly. Maybe Australia as well. But there are poets writing in English who come from other backgrounds. And I mean, you do, you do quote lots of, well, you know, you've got Spanish, Italian, you've got Scandinavian. You do have a, a range. And as I say, reading the book, it really is like going into a really a mind that's full of ferment, full of interesting, <laughs> uh, you know, valuable judgments and observations about that extend the poem into into political areas. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to make those connections all all the way through, but not to make yeah. them in very obvious ways. People talk about political poetry. They tend to think about poetry that's got a specific political message or idea at center. I said yeah. that poetry, poetry is political because it insists on what we've been talking about, insists on paying attention to details, insists on not muddying the language, not clouding the language. I mean, yes. I, I, I hesitate to quote T.S. Eliot because I've got so much against him in many ways. But, you know, um, I, I don't like the idea of purifying, but maintaining or sustaining or nourishing the dialect of the tribe, you know? Speaking of nourishing, just let me... I'm yeah. gonna Quote you, I'm going to quote you here. Uh, we're closing. We're closing in on the <laughs> time, gentlemen, or whatever it was. <laughs> um, it nourishes us to contribute to our grieving and healing processes. It gives focus to our loves and to our fears, allowing us to sing them at the back of our minds in a deliberate and disciplined transformation of noise into music of grief into acceptance, of anger at pointless destruction into a determination to save at least something of what remains. Poetry makes so much happen, in fact, that I'm at a loss to count the ways. <laughs> and though Frost's golden age of poetry and power may never come, no other art form has done so much to establish the basic human truth which must serve as the touchstone of our judgment. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, I'm, when I hear that, I'm put in mind of how much bullshit goes down at the United Nations and how 
much bullshit comes out of uh, the mouths of, well, like Canada's prime minister, who's, mm-hmm. who talks about genocide, claiming that what happened in the school system, the residential school system in Canada was genocide. And yet, apparently, by all accounts, exactly the same thing is happening in China. And he won't call it genocide. No. Not politics. Well, it's there's an ulterior motive, I guess. Of course. There's yeah, like, I, okay, he doesn't want to lose their trade. So so the poet's job is what? To call bullshit? At times it does, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you remember that Sharon Olds uh, poem when she, that she wrote about the Bushes, about the Bushes regime. Every now and again, you need, you need someone just to, just to stand up and call actually directly call bullshit on specific bullshit. The more general enterprise, shall we say, is to stand up for certain values to do with language and, and, and creaturely humanity that doesn't compromise. The first chapter of the book that I actually wrote my satisfaction at least was um or my near satisfaction was the the chapter on frost and kennedy because it's people remember that frost spoke at kennedy's inauguration but the full story wasn't very well known i found i thought people knew the story better than than perhaps they did and more importantly what frost did afterwards um you know because frost actually there's a really nice essay by um, james p cars the philosopher um, about Robert Frost and how Robert Frost worked. And it's called Like a Random Bear. It's a really nice short essay. But what Carlos notes, of course, is that Kennedy thought that he was using Frost for his yes. agenda. Yeah. Frost was attempting to use Kennedy for his agenda in terms of his, his values. And I thought it was tragic the way in which um, Frost was treated. A very old man by this time was treated on, after the trip to Russia. And he went to Russia with very, very sort of powerful intentions and hopes and wanted, really wanted to try and contribute in some way to creating some kind of you know, peace. Yeah. peace. Yeah, effectively. Yeah, or at least lessening the tension. And he was treated with, he was treated abominably by Kennedy and his people. Well, that's because, that's because he says, you report in the book, he says, that the United States is too liberal to use the weapons? Is that it? Well, no, what he was trying to say was that um, the, 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 the chief sin that he committed was to say that both these civilizations, America and Russia, these civilizations that receive wisdom in America being that this was the evil tyrannical empire, empire over there. It wasn't a civilization. And, and, and Frost recognized that. I mean, you know, when he arrives in Russia, he meets all these great Russian poets. He meets Anna Akhmatova. Yeah. You know, which I'd love to have done if I could have one of my ambitions to down <laughs> and talk to Anna Akhmatova, you know. But um, he meets these people. He reads Khrushchev, I think, very well, although Khrushchev is playing him. He think, or at least he thinks he's playing him. He right. reads him very well. And um, Khrushchev played all kinds of little games with Frost to um, try and win him over. But Frost isn't naive. People think he was naive. He wasn't naive. He was trying to do the best that he could under the circumstances. He also came back after like a 17 hour play. Yeah. But I thought, I thought that what he did when he came back, he said something like, in effect, Kennedy is too liberal and he's not, he won't use the weaponry. And that tilted the, he thought, the, uh, negotiations possibly or he he painted kennedy in a way that kennedy didn't like that's why kennedy throws him out well he he actually was trying to convey that khrushchev thought that kennedy was too liberal to use the weapon he he thought this the main point as i say was equating the united states and russia a soviet union rather as equally civilized and modern states that was the sin that he didn't paint the russians as the bad guys exactly and, and I think Kennedy can probably completely understood intellectually what Frost was doing and what he was trying to do. Um, but he knew that he had to dissociate himself from Frost because of things. Yes, that, I see. Frost I was see. just telling the damn truth, you know. Well, that's and that gets down to it, doesn't it? He's yeah. telling the truth in hopes of moving us toward world peace. Exactly. The thing about it, and the thing about it is um, that's naive. It's not well, naive in poetry, though. I mean, that's no, what exactly, exactly. For. It's naive for a politician. That's naive. A politician is playing chess. 
you know, and it's using the, the deductive reasoning, and that's all they're using. Uh, Frost is feeding it too. And the thing is, it's like I, I've been involved in some way with, with environmentalism for since the 80s, early 80s, um, perhaps a little before that, even. And I've always felt naive by, by, you know, by being involved in, in that. It's naive for me to think that this society that we have now will change enough that we'll stop doing the damage we're doing. On the other hand, I, I don't want to become cynical or defeatist and say, okay, forget it. It's not going to happen. Let's just give up. And that's where, that's where you know, we need poets and we need other artists, actually, because we use all our faculties and we say, okay, my head's telling me this is a hopeless cause, but my heart yes. is saying, there's no other game in town, you know? Yes. Yeah, it's such an interesting point. Well, so finally then, what it is, is number one, unmasking hypocrisy. Yeah. But number two, helping us to maintain a hope in the face of really not, not very good looking odds. Yeah, I think so. Because but the thing is also is that we tend to usually count the odds a bit short. We tend to be even uh, more in line, people tend to be short term in their thinking. People always say things like, um, without really thinking about it too deeply, um, I'm a short-term pessimist, but a long-term optimist. Right. But I actually do feel that. I, I'm short-term yeah. pessimist. There's going to be a lot of damage, I'm afraid. There's going to be a lot of bad things happening because of climate, because of other things, um, species uh, depletion, ocean acidification, etc., cetera, uh, habitat loss, the degradation of the environment generally. But in the, if you set your clock to something larger and longer term, then yeah. I feel more optimistic, you know. Maybe what poetry is about is, is understanding, helping us to understand so that we can ultimately survive. Yeah, not us necessarily, because we won't survive. Nobody ever survives. But <laughs> life, whatever the spark is, you know. Yeah. People are always trying to explain how meditation works. And... Um, I've gone back to meditation after a long time of not, of being really sloppy in my life. I started mm -hmm. meditating again, but one of the things that's really interesting is trying to explain to somebody, when someone says to you, what do you mean you breathe in, you breathe out, and that's it, you, everything changes, you know? That's <laughs> right. Obviously not that simple. You listen to your breathing too, right? Yeah, yeah, and you listen to everything. Yeah, but one of the things I found really interesting was one of the meditation teachers I had a long time ago said, when you get into your meditation, you start to realize that all of the things that you think of yourself, you know, your, yourself, your ego, whatever you want to call it, yourself as being, are kind of you know temporary and, and, and kind of provisional. And, and when you get into that level of just breathing in, breathing out, and, and, and not thinking about you know, what's going on over there, and, and then you realize that all that's left is consciousness, awareness, attention, that's all there is, and you know, I'm not I'm not religious in the traditional way or anything like that. But I do believe that you know we are ephemeral as instances. This social instance that I am born in a certain place with a certain name, doing a certain job or something, that's ephemeral. But whatever it is that informs me, the consciousness that informs me, has some other uh, uh, life of its own. It's not mine. I'm not going to be reborn. But can you still be conscious of it, though, once you're dead? <laughs> I don't know. That doesn't matter about that. Because <laughs> consciousness continues. <laughs> and that's, it's so difficult to talk about. I usually don't, but these days anyway. And hopefully hopefully you can kind of cast a sidewise glance at occasionally from a poem, you know. Well, this is great. I appreciate, I appreciate talking to you uh, and listening to you. It's really great to see you again after all these yeah. years. Yeah. It is. It's great to see you, yeah. John uh, Burnside is the author of The Music of Time, Poetry in the 20th Century. That's published by Profile Books. In the UK, yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. And what is that part of? What big conglomerate is that part of? No, that's noise. I think it's just Profile. Is it? Yeah, it's still pretty independent. One guy runs it, yeah. Even better reason to get the book. And and any final thoughts, John? Uh, well, I'm just, I mean, I enjoyed the talk and there would be so much more to say, actually. There is, uh, it's yeah. true. 
I think the best thing to say is, uh, and be listening to this, is go away and read those poems. You know, the poems that we've been talking about, they, they say it best. I was going to bring up Dance to the Music of Time, but I didn't. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. I just, that was really coincidence, nothing else. I mean, I was aware of no, it. No, I didn't. The only alternative title would have been um, The Music of What Happens. And that's so much associated with Seamus Healy and, and also with Shazlas Miosh as well. I didn't want to make it sound like it was directed at a particular, you know, on particular directions. So, you know, there were several attempts at making a title work, but I thought that was the best title. I think so, too. I mean, it doesn't matter that it riffs off Powell anyway. I like it. Not at all. And, and of course, it was really intended to, to be a kind of commentary on um, Mandelstam's um, concept of the noise of time, history yes. of the noise of time. The original version of the book was actually, when I first started putting the thing together, was much more just directed at straight historical politics. So there's a lot in the Russian Russian Revolution, for example, which I just cut in the end. I didn't think it added anything to the book. It was powerful what you had to say about the whole Spanish Civil War. It resonated with me because I, I was just at a dinner party with a, a Chinese-Canadian. He's about my age. And uh, just talking about the fact that everyone in China knows that they're being fed bullshit, but you, you can't step out of line. Otherwise, you know, they've got such a grip on you mm -hmm. that, you know, no one's going to, no one wants to die, you know, or get thrown in the slammer. But the fact is, you know, it's like a billion, 1.4 billion, and yet they're all pissed off and they can't save their mind. They can't write poetry what we've just been talking about. They can't do that. It's an amazing country. It's full of amazing people and an amazing history. And it's just tragic that these small people are running it the way they're running and killing people and slaughtering people. But then what happened in Burma uh, yesterday? The villagers getting burned and the people murdered. And it's all over. I mean, you know, the Russian dictatorship and you know, everywhere you look, uh, all across Europe as well, so the swing towards the right. And then um, the, the Times of London talking about South American politics and uh, everybody who, who isn't in our pocket in South America is some kind of left-wing dictator, you know. Yeah, that's the way they're labeled, yeah. Yep. And then people believe that it's, it's the Times. You, know, you, you can't doubt the Times, you know. No, it's not no. Fox News, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> they're, all, they're all lying to us, you know, which is the one good use of the, that is the one good use of the internet. People can exchange cultural ideas and they can exchange information. They can exchange, you know, and hopefully it, it can't be censored. Or if it does get censored, you just move a little bit to the left or the right out of the way, you know. But yeah. well, It's great that we can do this too. Like, yeah, exactly. Know, That's what I mean. You know, this kind of exchange. We can talk to each other. Really, so. really. Yeah. And see each other. Yeah. Well, you know, um, there's some research now being done on, just coming out of the, you know, there's some excavations of mass graves under Franco, and there's more stuff coming out about um, what happened under Franco, and Jonathan Meads has a really good program about it as well. I mean, for me, the, the, the great shame of the 20th century, other than the Holocaust, obviously, yeah. was the way in which everyone tried to use Spain as a pawn in their game, Russia in its way, the UK, yeah. America in its way. And, you know, I've always thought of that period as, as a period of an attempt to create a new state, a new way of being in a country. The, the revolutionary kind of thought that informed the, 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 the Republican ideal was something really admirable. You know, and it was, drew people, didn't it? It drew poets from him. Yeah, yeah. Also, that generation of Spanish poets wasn't just Lorca and a couple of others. It was a whole generation of people, including... And I'm glad to see in, in Spain a lot of work has been done on, on the women poets. I tried to mention the women poets. You but, did, yes. But only with a very short span. But the lots of work has been done on some of the women poets who contributed to, the, to that movement and were also part of the revolution and part of the resistance to Franco. I think, you know, people will, will, will be going back to the Spanish Civil War and, uh, and, and what happened under Franco. And especially in our current time with the move towards authoritarianism, across the world, you know, Trumpism and, you know, and anyway, I don't want to think about it. No, 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 but it's, it's a lesson. It's a lesson, isn't it? And, it, and Absolutely, it, yeah. The poets are the ones that provide, uh, hopefully provide the detail. Sure. That's wonderful. Thanks. Uh, thanks again for your time. Thank you, Nigel. It'll be fun.